where are we? Yeah, right there. Oh so yeah, here, down here. 41, 42, yeah. Okay, so somebody want to read it out because my eyes are not so good. Okay. Section 42. Well, Cameron, why don't you just read the passages? Oh yeah, uh, a little bit higher is where it starts. Um, yeah, so. Uh, I gave the name of radical empiricism to my Vez Anshang. Uh, empiricism is known as the opposite of rationalism. Rationalism tends to emphasize universals and to make wholes prior to parts in the order of logic as well as that of being. Empiricism, on the contrary, lays the explanatory stress upon the part, the element, the individual, and treats the whole as a collection and the universal as an abstraction. My description of things accordingly starts with the parts and makes up the whole being of the second order. Um, okay. that to be radical, an empiricism must neither admit to its con constructions any oh. element, uh, uh, admit to its constructions any element that is not directly experienced, nor exclude from them any element that is directly experienced. Okay, right there. So the first thing is empiricism. So maybe we can have an example of a theory that's uh, not empirical, that's not empiricist, that's more uh, what people might call idealist or transcendental even. So what, what, what would be a way of thinking that way? You know, it's more um, based on big ideas and then going to particulars. Yeah. Isn't there like the like primary distinction is like you can come to like the oh actually i don't know whether it's you can come to understand the world or you experience the world such such where in, in empiricism it's direct kind of sensory information whereas rationalism or idealism there's some type of there's a way of generating understanding about reality independent of experience that would be independent of experience would be going to some ideal things or transcendental mm -hmm. things, you know. So what would be some like sciences that are like that, starting from the big idea or the big abstraction and then going to particulars, you know, or, or you know, science or economics or life or whatever, any kind of account that's more big ideas first. Maybe we're too empiricist, all of us. Yeah. Kind of like, I think either two weeks ago, we were talking about like Eastern versus Western medicine, and that one's more, I don't know, I guess I kind of related to the discussion on intrinsic and extrinsic as well. Like, um, uh, like in religion, you mean? Like in medicine, or religion? Medicine. Medicine. What would be kind of the, the, the universal from the, from the abstract or universal? What would be an example? I don't know. Yeah. Medicine seems to be very much based on like particular syndromes, right? Yeah. You know, colitis or tinnitus or whatever, you know, all these particular syndromes. And you, and uh, the big ideas, I don't know. I mean, in, China, in Chinese medicine, right, there are these big ideas like qi, right? The question of qi and then this idea. But that's, that would be like an example of a, a big abstraction and then you can particularize. Um, okay, that's, that's what, something like that. How about in science? In science? The kind of science that starts with big ideas and then goes to particulars. I think economics is one that you know we have these these big broad concepts that I mean I guess when you talk about capitalism in particular we there's this concept of the invisible hand and that that invisible hand um, mm -hmm. is what create structure in marketplace in the markets right and um everything flows from there yeah, this is what, yeah, the big one yeah but didn't the market exist in the first place and then we give them a name instead of the op the other way in fact historically yeah right and historically I, I guess i mean that's how people started start with simple markets and mm -hmm. But trading things and bringing some food into the village and selling the food in the village that you put from the field, right? Sure, historically. And then we had this big idea called 
the market with the capital M with the invisible hand. But does this still be considered idealism? So if you think about the theory, right? If we mm -hmm. teach a theory to first year econ students, well, I don't know if they might took, they might here take a course in economics. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, okay. So you start with uh, supply and demand, right? They give you these supply curves. I know it brings up pleasant memories. No, no pleasant <laughs> memories. <laughs> right? Well, yeah. So these, these it's exactly what, what Tanya is saying. You have this kind of um, idea of um, some intersection between your know, utility functions and preference functions and and uh, and what the uh, suppliers are willing to sell their goods at, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that would be an example of a mathematical theory, which kind of hides all the historical messinesses of how markets really evolve. It also hides what people really do, right? Remember then for the weird article, we have all these uh, uh, um, observational empirical, empirical, right? Observations about how people really make decisions and they don't behave like classical, you know, atomic economic subjects. They just don't, they don't optimize things. They may not have a clearly defined mathematical preference function, for example, that you can, you can optimize for. Okay, so that's, a, that's an example for sure, right? So empiricism is the other way. It's starting from kind of ground up, right? From the, but what you can observe. So that's empirical. What can we observe? Now, uh, I, think, I think Cameron wrote a, a note about James asking about um, apparent monism. Um, you wanna say, Cameron, I don't want to put you on the spot, but you're not on the spot, you're somewhere else. Uh, what, 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 what was meant by the comment? What do you mean by what do you, which would be meant by monism? Okay, well, what's meant? What monism and uh, Rachel and I were having this uh, little discussion about whether we thought that um, James was advocating or kind of assuming a monism or like a dualism. So monism that there's like essentially one uh, essence from which all things emerged in dualism that there's uh two types of essence from which all things emerge or like philosophically oh sorry or uh like perceptually there's uh there's a distinction between subject and object is also what's what dualism uh looks at uh i don't know i i was trying to figure out how monism was being applied um here in terms of like perception, um, cause that was my feeling or my, well, that, that was what I gathered from reading this, that that's what James was getting at. Um, that there was some, that consciousness didn't exist as like an independent thing. Actually, I'm I'm not quite sure. Um, you know, that, that's good because I'm, the reason I'm asking this question or bringing this up is because you know, here on 20 or I think, yeah, page 20 or section 41, just to repeat, you said that empiricism, the empiricism must neither admit into its constructions any element that's not directly experienced. Okay, the, the idea of direct experience is really important. Mm -hmm. So when you say empirical, it means experienced. Okay, not necessarily a scientific observation. Okay, that's a lot more apparatus. It's just that it's directly experienced. Nor should it exclude any element that's not directly experienced. So if we think about economics, right? There might be all sorts of directly experienced things like familial loyalty or, you know, um, all sorts of uh, irrational, <laughs> irrational desires, or, et cetera, or even contradictory preferences um, uh, uh, that just aren't accounted for in the theory. And so just ignored, right? So this is a very, very strong constraint. Say you, if you, for any theory, you need to be able to account for what's direct experience. Okay, so that's one point. Um, so, so, this, but, so what exact, what exactly does it mean by not exclude from them any element that is? Okay, actually, sorry, I missed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, for example, in economics, let's say you know, let's say, let's say, okay, preference functions. Usually in economics, which is a, oh. a, it's a notion of a, of a strict ordering, right? I give people a bunch of products and they can sort them for me into most preferred down to least preferred, okay? So here's the classic conundrum. I give you, I suppose we do two A-B tests, you know, uh, do you prefer uh, chocolate? Chocolate versus strawberry ice cream, chocolate. How about strawberry versus peach? Strawberry. How about peach versus chocolate? You know, uh, it, uh, what did I say? Peach? 
Anyway, you get this A over B, B over C, C over A, and then you no longer have an ordering. So this is very common in, in, in kind of questions that, that people, humans are not, um, they don't have this new rational. Okay. Uh, so this breaks the theory because the theory needs, for example, I'm just using this as a, as a toy example, needs a, a well-ordered uh, preference function in order to even get its own. Uh, and so you can't exclude that because yeah. it's directly experienced. Because it's, it would be uh, 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 abstracting to say, oh, well, people all have a, a preference, well-defined preference functions. That's a, that's the very beginning of your economic theory. Well, <laughs> it's not empirical. Okay, not, not the way it is. So it's a very strong requirement, actually. Did you think about physics, for example, the way we do physics, we ignore lots of stuff, right? We ignore emotional stuff, ignore his, history, human history. We ignore, ignore, ignore. So from the point of view of William James, or a pragmatist um, empiricist, that these are not really empirical, not strongly empirical. <laughs> and and it's it's more than just a philosophy of science or an epistemology. Of, there's something else there that yeah. I don't quite understand. Well, yeah, I mean, think about also notice that nowhere here does he say mental is physical, right? So direct experience could be could be experienced by what I'm feeling or thinking, right? I could directly experience something in my thoughts too. This is a lot of the essays that we're going to look at. Mm. So it's actually, it sounds uh, simple, but it's not simple really uh, to, to, to say direct experience. Okay, now this is empiricist. Now what about, what makes empir empiricist radical empiricist? We heard it already from Cameron's reading, but what makes it radical for William James, writing those passages? You know, I'm just gonna assume that you guys can all access the uh, text yourself, so I can keep the zoom on, on people's faces, okay? about that. But you can call out and read out the passages as we go. Um, so again, in, think, in 42, he talks about that. 42, uh, what makes it rash? Sorry, look over your shoulder. It's right there. Um, to be radical, I'll read it. Empiricism must neither admit, sorry. Oh, go in the italic section. For, for such a philosophy, the relations that connect experiences must themselves be experienced relations. <clears throat> and any kind of relation experience must be accounted as real as anything else in the system. Okay. So let's make it Perfectly concrete. clear. No, 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 please say, let's make it concrete. <laughs> let's make it concrete. Uh, let's, let's take an example of people as uh, relations among people, okay? So, and suppose we're dealing with again economics or psychology or something about people. So what would what would be examples of relations among people? Yeah, whether anthropology, psychology, economics, let's take some relations. Like any kind? Well, common ones, you know. Oh, like familial relationships. Familiar relationships, you know, daughter, son you know, uh, marriage, husband, whatever, okay? So, okay. Um, but usually when we, when we start, we might say, well, let's first, if you want to do a social study, first we say, well, what are the people, right? So, um, but then the relationships can get more, um, well, I think any number of nuances, right? It's not just blood relations, it's also all sorts of familial relationships, affect, affective relationships, right? Emotional relationships, right? So then um, what they're saying here, what he's saying here is that those relationships should be counted as, as real as the fleshy body of a specific people, right? You think about it. I mean, sure, some relations you can check off in a census form, right? Um, but most relationships don't have a name even, it, you know, affect relationships. There's always this kind of running um, Right, that social scientists and census bureaus have to have. Think about, you know, even like um, gender, right? Now we have non binary genders, we have gender fluid identities, et cetera, et cetera, right? So they don't exist in the census categories. They, I mean, they're just barely getting into it. 
So there you have a very concrete, I mean, they're fully real to the people who experience uh, their identities in such, or perform their identities in such, in such a way, but they don't exist as far as the census is concerned. Yeah. So this is a very strong constraint to say, you know, if you're going to build be an empiricist, you've got to admit those relationships as uh, in science, in computer science, we call them first class objects. In the computer programming language, first class object would be the basic terms of your ontology, you know, like integer, <laughs> string, you know, um, or, you know, logical, you know, not operator. Um, so, so it's very strong. So what, what would uh, the relation that connects an experience of like, um, let's say like my experience of being on the Zoom call with my experience of being on the Zoom call a week ago. Uh, but I guess seeing what the relationships or what the- Like what, yeah, what is the, what is the kind of relation experience that's accounted as real, as as real as my participating in the Zoom? Uh, relation of the self to the um, thing that the self is thinking about, or a relation among two things that the well, I'll say the mind mind is considering. These are two different kinds of. You're talking about the latter, like you know, um, I I'm thinking of um, I don't know, uh, 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 you know, okay, like this. I'm thinking of uh, this conversation today, and I'm thinking of another conversation last week. I think that's your example, right? And I'm relating those two together. That kind of relation, and that's a very subtle question. Yeah, um, well, it's what what is like. What's the relation there? I mean, my, like my initially, this made a lot of sense because I I was like, oh yeah, this is very um, like complex complex systemsy, where like sometimes the the part or like the pieces don't really matter. It's just the relationships between them that matters. But then I started thinking about it, I'm like, wait, what does it mean for the relationship to be as real as like the objects? Um, so I, I took this to be very much like thinking about when I was when I was reading that part, I was thinking a lot about the different. So like the memory of a thing being as 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 the actual first experience. So like so you're talking about like, oh, you're on a Zoom call last week and you have that memory. And if you think about that call, it's you're actually recreating the exact experience in your mind i'm not saying this very well but <laughs> but something to do with memory and the process of memory being very much the same process as having a thought or idea in your in your mind that is in front of you the perception of it i don't know I'm not sure. I'm actually not sure. I'm trying to channel James. I mean, the, the thing to do with all these people is to actually channel them. In other words, right? In other words, what would James say? The second, what would James say? And actually, I'm not sure. I would. I know. I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't. I don't have a good enough sense of this to to be able to answer that. Um, because I'm just thinking later on, we're gonna we're gonna go back and look at what Tanya was pointing to, right? The you know um, how I experience or perceive uh, the mental candle, right? Or the mental image, I shouldn't say image, the, the my mental idea of uh, Memorial Hall, this building that was on the campus, okay? Versus being standing right in front of that, that building, okay? That, those two different kinds of relationships are like perceptual relationships. I'm not sure if you would call them, you would think of those as the same as relationships, the way what he meant, the way that we meant relation just now, like familiar relations. I don't know, okay, we'd have to look further into the text okay because i think i understand i think uh, i think yeah it, it, i think i i think the first order concept of just take some concrete objects out there and look at relations among them treat them all as first order that's okay but if we talk about memory i don't know i don't know i think that that's that's hard okay 
I don't know. Yeah. And it's like, what are the, what are the units of the experience and what are the like possibilities of relation between them? Yeah. 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 Um, uh, for example, um, even this question of um, memory in the in in the passages that we read, that we will look at, he has this notion of um, uh, perception, like mental perception, perceiving uh, a, a candle. There's this fic uh, well fictive perceiving an actual candle, um, and these are all he uses word perceive. Right. Or I think he uses other words like that too, but not relate to. And then he says that uh, he's interested in this kind of direct perception and not mediated by all this uh, theory, like theoretical constraints between me and that percept. So he has a notion of direct perception there. Okay. Which means to me that maybe he's thinking of those as kind of direct experiences. They're not mediated by relation in the, in the sense of relation in this passage. Okay. But not sure. Um, but we should, okay, because I, I, he has other, do you remember there was a discussion of space in this passage, in these uh, essays? I don't want to jump to it now, okay? But this is a forward reference, is that he has this notion of space as a way of ordering um, uh, relations among um, objects. <clears throat> okay, it may be the memory or maybe even bigger than that, time, temporality might be a way to order relations among objects in your in your experience. Okay, so maybe there's a there's a different schema. Okay, okay. Now I don't want to be held to that because I'm not sure. Okay, because I, I don't remember reading about time in these essays. He might say that time is an abstraction, right? It's not warranted. It's, I would say that's a bit more empiricist way to approach it. Don't use things like times to abstract. Let's start from the beginning. Okay, let's start from the top. Um, does consciousness exist? Okay, so let's look at the very beginning of the first essay. I'm going to look over with a note here. Um, or maybe six or seven, um, he's talking about, is it page or section six? Let's go down to like six, six section, which starts getting underway, it'll be like section seven, section six. Yeah, talks about, yeah, yeah, okay. Something like that. Um, anybody wanna call out, you know, what's he talking about here? What's the big, uh, what's the core, core um, concept he's talking out here? Wait, so we're going to the beginning now? Yeah, the beginning of the first essay. Oh, God, I hope it's the right, the same passages as what I have in my notes. Where it talks about uh, experience, right? So, mm. yeah, what does he say about experience here? This is related to actually Carmen's question. Where it's like the moment we try to fix our attention upon consci consciousness and see what distinctly it is. It's a recent writer. It seems to vanish. That section. Where are you? Is that section seven? Yeah. Let's part it down then. Yes. It seems to vanish when we try to introspect the sensation of blue. All we can see is the blue. Okay. Where does he say, I'm reading from my notes, if we start with the supposition that there's only one primal stuff or material in the world, uh, a stuff of which everything's composed, we call that stuff pure experience. So what- Yeah, that's, that's section, um, it's like just after three, it's just a little bit above section seven and it starts out like it's I. So it's sex, it's the paragraph numbered. Yeah, okay. Four. Yeah. Thanks. thanks, thanks, thanks. Okay, page seven in the PDF and my thesis, blah, blah, blah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. there, that's the key beginning, I think. Yeah. Um, 
So, um, somebody want to read out that, that, that sentence? You want to try just reading it out so I can. I don't have thesis is that if we start with this. I'm sorry, my thesis is that if we start with the supposition, mm -hmm. supposition mm -hmm. that there is only one primal stuff or material in the world, a stuff for which everything is composed. And if we call that stuff pure experience, then knowing can easily be explained as a particular, particular sort of relations towards one another into which portion of pure experience may enter. The relation itself is a part of pure experience. One of its terms becomes the subject or, bear, or bearer of the knowledge. Mm -hmm. The knower, the other becomes the object know. This will need much explanation before it can be understood. That's for sure. OK, perfect. <laughs> this, I think, is his answer to Cameron's question, actually. Right, and this is very deep, right? So it's actually very cool. I think it's very cool because, see, first of all, he doesn't say that you have to have a subject object beforehand. He just has this pure experience, this kind of mass. And also be really careful. He says pure experience as if it's one thing, it's not one thing. He's gonna say later on, there are as many kinds of experiences as stuff as there are interpretations. So it's just um, explosively, complex, okay? But anyway, just as a starting point, uh, you start with pure experience without saying subjects and objects. And then you have these kind of chunks and Cameron's questions will come into play again. What's a chunk, you know, what's a piece? But then he says right away, there are relations among them. Because as soon as you have more than one thing, you can think about, well, how are these different things related to one another? And then he adds onto that right away. Those relations are also experience. So it's very, it's all folded, it's all, um, it's all, uh, you might say, uh, all, blend, all flat. It's what's called a flat ontology, actually, to use jargon. It's, it's all, um, it's, it's relations are as real as the things they relate, okay? So- and, uh, Is experience, the word experience he's using here, like how we would intuitively understand experience to be? We start with that. Okay. We start with that. Yes. But no, right away, you know, he doesn't say mental versus physical. Right. 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 So now look at the way he writes it. He says one of the one of its quote terms becomes the subject be, and the other becomes the object known. So everything's very contingent. It's not like ahead of time you have a theory and the theory says, okay, we have um, you know, humans and we have animals and we have boxes, uh, uh, inanimate objects ahead of time. So it could be, right, at some point, maybe uh, it turns out that what used to be called a subject is now the object, right? Well, think about it. If you're, you know, I, I think I'm a subject. Okay, I move around, I have intentions, things like that. But when I go to see a doctor, right, I become the object to the doctor. So it's not so mysterious, right? It's not, not so mysterious that this can flip, can change all the time. Okay, let's uh, walk. Okay, you guys, now, now we're underway. Uh, let's uh, keep going. So what are, what's the next uh, passage that you think we should look at, anyone? It's just moving forward from this point. Um, oh, um, it's on And now I was like, well, what? <laughs> but I thought it was cool because, like, it's just like recognizing consciousness is like makes it go away. So. <laughs> so this whole essay here is 
The question is, does consciousness exist? And he's going to say no. It doesn't, well, actually, it's not necessary, okay, uh, as a concept, okay, as a thing. But he's going to be careful. I think, doesn't he say at the beginning that he's, he says, right away, he kind of hedges it. He says, look, I'm not arguing, I'm, I'm not, what is it? I'm just saying that consciousness is not a substance, like, you know, like energy. It, um, well, even energy is abstract too, like steel. But um, I, don't, I, I don't disagree that there are acts of consciousness, that consciousness is a function. He says it very clearly. Consciousness can be, it can be as a function, okay? Like knowing, uh, awareness of. Um, but later on, so what's this thing about disappearing? Like, like what is it that's kind of F and F that like eludes? Like why should it elude us? Go back I think it. I think that that comes. I mean, even earlier on the parts we were just going over, this idea of self, and in order to have an opt, there has to be an observer mm -hmm. in order to observe something, right? And trying to understand. Um, I think that also comes back, like what we were talking about just a few minutes ago, the object can also be your own thoughts. So if you are thinking about your own thoughts, then what is the, who's the observer, who's seeing? Um, and that's, I think, is part of that sense of where does it go? You know, once you try to become conscious of consciousness acting upon, even acting upon itself, you can't figure out what's the locus. Um, and it starts. Right where, like, the number six is, says um, consciousness as such is entirely impersonal. Self and its activities belong to the content. So it's not for the content to recognize consciousness yeah. or the observer too. And we we should be careful that in these passages he's trying he's trying to put up this uh, thing that he's going to argue against. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's and great. so that's this is what philosophers like to do. So I said, wait a minute, wait, whose side are you on? You know, is this the thing that's supposed to knock down or what? I think this is this is where he's going to knock it down. Okay, so six, seven, eight, and and the thing is, I I don't know about the paint. I'm not convinced about the paint example. But this is what it brings in the paint example, that he's setting it up, okay, that this is something that's not going to work for him. But he, he, and then the paint example, remember, he was talking about, it's as if we think of um, consciousness and experience and mind as if it were like paint in the following way, that it's got, uh, what is it here? Yeah, uh, it's eight, section eight, paint has a, in the middle, paint has a dual constitution involving as it does the oil, you know, the clear, and the mass of content in terms of the pigment. Like, you know, we go to Home, home Depot, we we'll get some paint. They always do that, right? They, they, they add the dye to it later and they mix it up with the, with the, with the, with the carrier, the oil. Mm. And then he's going to say this, and this kind of dual factor uh, theory of experience doesn't hold water haha, for him. That um, he says, for me, it's just the opposite. That's under section two. Now my contention is exactly the ver reverse. Experience, I believe, has no such inner duplicity. I just start from the ground up with experience, full stop, experience, you know? Um, and again, he uses the paint. So I did just take the paint as already there. You know, it's already got colors and, and consistency. Yeah, he's saying here, just take the paint and paint it around, paint stuff with it, paint the chair, paint the house, paint the painting. And then he says, just so, with a capital S, so I maintain, does a given undivided portion of experience taken in one context of associates play the part of a knower, of a state of mind, and then another part plays a part of the thing known, just like what he was saying before. So it's all experience, it's all pain. Don't think of trying to divide it into two different kinds of substances. And the, and the, then the invisible part is gonna be, it's called the oil, it's gonna be called consciousness consciousness and the pigment is going to be called the content of the consciousness consciousness about something is that something which is going to be like the color and he says oh this is too much theory too much abstraction okay oh so it's like the experience is the like 
I see. So it's like the experience, the object of the experience as consciousness. It's not like it's a, it's not like there is consciousness that's there and it's experiencing something. Right, right. It's 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 as if, in other words, if we try to posit consciousness, yeah. like, not get the analogy, right? Its analogy is as if paint were considered in this kind of binary form. There is the dye, which is whatever powder or you know, concentrate you inject, inject in, and then there's this carrier, which is clear. The oil. Right. Right. And he's saying in that kind of theory, consciousness is like the oil, the transparent part, you know. And what is consciousness about? I, I'm conscious of my hunger, or consciousness of this owl camera. That's like the dye, the pigment, the content. Okay. Oh. So he's saying, wait a minute, this doesn't, it's not necessary. So this, like, is what, this is what he was saying a few a few uh sections lower of like the it, it, like it can't be two things it, it, but uh there's the puzzle where like when two lines intersect the point can be defined as the two lines but it's not actually two this is paragraph 12 or so well, yeah 12 search for a puzzle that's a nice yeah that's a nice point actually it's a nice point so the, the puzzle of how one identical room can be in two places is that bottom just the puzzle of how one identical point can be in two lines it can if the situate if be it it can if it be situated at their intersection and similarly if the pure experience of the room were in a place of intersection of two processes which connected it with two, with different groups of associates res respectively it could be counted twice over as belonging to either group and spoken of loosely as existing in two places yeah, I think this is a very important point. It's a, it's a it's a it's a it's a different point, but also very very cru crucial. I see. Um, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's it's um it's also talking about experiences that can be shared, right? Um, ex experiences can be shared uh, by more than one uh, series of thoughts. Okay, um, that's also the other essay, right? Can what is it? Can two minds ever share the same thing? That's really the core of the, that essay too. Okay. Um, let's keep going down that section. Okay, so keep going here. Um, right there, the section 13. Okay, to carry on with this example that, that Cameron just mentioned. Suppose we have a room, or say room experience, experience of the room. And then there, this is really cool, right? Here it says, there, in that passage, one of them is the reader's personal biography, and the other is the history of the house of which the room is part. And now that I read it, I said, well, wait a minute, then who's the who's thinking that? I mean, right? If I think about the room as me, like this room here, I've taught many, many classes in this room. Most I have my personal history of this room. And then he says, the other, the other stream of experiences is the history of the room of which, or the house of which the room is part. But a history for whom, you think? For, for whom is this history? For the house. For the house, a yeah. hall. Mm. Well, does it, this is where this part is. I really start to um, kind of struggle a little bit because it it also it brings to mind for me that I <clears throat> I can't direct my whatever is my field of consciousness cannot directly experience anything. It's always being experienced through these inputs, these perceptual organs and and then and then projected onto my i don't know wait, wait, my mind whatever right like it, it that's the conscious experience but it's i'm not necessarily experiencing the room as it is because there could be another being another entity another observer who experiences everything very differently from the way my perceptual organs function. But that wouldn't change the physical nature of the room. Okay, there's a lot that's packed into what Rachel and Tanya just said. Okay, so this is very, very, very interesting. Um, let's go backwards, start with what Tanya you just saying. So, so, so this, I wish we were in the same space physical space, I could draw diagrams on the board, but I'm going to wave my hands and some of you say you can imagine the drawing I'm going to make. 
So, so this kind of um, if, if you move to the uh, to the whiteboard and talk, I think it, we could possibly see it. I think the camera will. Oh yeah, maybe it'll work. Well, I got them to order fresh ten, so I hope they're. <laughs> you know what? I'm just going to. Uh, so see. Yeah, maybe this work. Um, I'm not sure this cartoon is going to be fair, uh, but let me just. Um, well, let's just say we have some objects in the in the world, and then we have this person that's observing the object. Oh, eyes here. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah. Um, you sort of see what I just drew? Yeah, yeah, we can see oh, it. Okay. So, okay, and then we have this idea of perception, okay, per uh, body perceiving object like house, off screen. Hello, come on. You guys have to stop chewing, you're distracting oh. me. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so here's the thing. Suppose, uh, uh, I'm just gonna riff uh, Tanya off what you're saying, so they may not be exactly what you were thinking. So this idea of perception, so as if it's mediated, if we say it's mediated, that means it either it's mediated outside of the telescope, so instruments, or internally. If it's internally mediated, then we have this idea of, of all this visual cortex, all this neural network, neural uh, stuff going on, processing going on. And then <laughs> the results are projected onto some mind, you know, this is a black rectangle here is the consciousness you know, sitting inside here. But this, don't you, isn't it reasonable to say, well, you know, this is just like uh, repeating the problem one step. Is that way to explain how this black box called the mind or consciousness is working? We're right back to where we are again. So this idea of mediation that is mediated by technology, it was mediated by uh, visual uh, cortex, it was mediated by the visual pathways, processing, mediated, all that, those are all theories, or right, right, theories and technologies that are um, built of basically concretizations and of abstractions and abstractions that are um, posed, posited to account for perception, okay? Um, and this is what's called a homunculus problem. The homunculus problem is that when we have we look at a lot of these kinds of psychologistic theories that account for perception, at some point we reach kind of the end of the story, which is oh, and then we have something inside me, which is now receiving all these uh, process perceptions, and that's how I am conscious of what's going on. But this black box, it's itself a little baby human, a miniature human. It's called homunculus, miniature human. It in the period positive inside. So we have a nested series of like Russian dolls. Okay. So this doesn't really work. But this is what happens to, and this is another reason why um, James is insisting on direct experience. And, we'll, and other people too. Okay. Then we can quibble about what's direct. Okay. But this word direct is very important. Mm -hmm. But is he, okay, I'm confused a little because don't don't we have like we can perceive something directly or we can perceive something as mediated through some abstraction right like if i i can i can just like perceive the content of like this water in front of me and i can just like pay attention to like the very like empirical qualities of it that's that, that's part of my uh, kind of stream of experience or i can kind of have a veil of abstraction and see it as part of like this like as a um i don't know like <clears throat> there's like a company that produced this water yeah, bottle. okay or h2o you think i think of it H2O. Or H2O. yeah that's or like it has these like physical qualities that I don't actually know yeah, yeah. empirically, but I know theoretically. I think now, now let's just see what James might say. Would, would, isn't it plausible that James might say, hey, 
uh, in one case, I'm perceiving water, wet water drinking. Another case, I'm thinking of not of water drinking, but water drinking that I'm drinking, but of H2O. So these are two different experiences, right? So and in this latter, when you say mediated, well, then I'm, I'm, I'm experiencing water as chemistry, all right, as a chemical formula. Right. So it's, all, it's experience because it's just you're experiencing the abstraction of it. Well, here's the thing. Abstraction could be through a telescope. I mean, like a bring distant close, well, abstraction uh, technology or abstraction in terms of chemical theory. But I think uh, uh, what James would be looking at is the resultant experiences. They're all gonna be resulting in experiences. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the end of the line, so to speak, the experiences. And then we can look at different kinds of experiences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I forgot your point. Uh, Rachel, you said something earlier. Um, I, was gonna get I think it, you were asking the, the history of the house of which the room is part. Ah, oh, right. And you were saying. To me, that meant from the perspective of the house. I think that's pretty cool. <laughs> Great. That's the most radical answer you could give. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Did you hear that? So, you know, this, in a sense, the, what we bring up to the present day uh, of well, the way people are thinking about stuff, the more than, so it's called more than human, um, is just this, is that really, if we really be um, consistent in pushing this kind of um, thinking about experience without an a priori subject, and we think about all these different relations as being as valid as uh, relata, as they say, et cetera, et cetera, and take a non-dualist approach, uh, then it does follow uh, that it gives us a reason to admit into this account um, perceiving subjects that are not just the human being subjects. Yeah. yeah. Or maybe a better way to put it, um, uh, well, okay, we'll get there. Uh, well, it's okay, it's a general move in this kind of work is if we try to you think that, oh, wow, we're ungrounded. We, we don't have objects and subjects a priori. What are we going to do? Well, maybe one thing we can do is to just flip the definition. In other words, maybe think of that which is human is that which you know has these kinds of responses to experience, right? That which, let's say, orders events from uh, more uh, ordered to more chaotic, sees uh, events that are more chaotic as being somehow later, thermodynamically later, than the events that are more ordered, you know, like the thermodynamic arrow of time, and using a power to, or, or, or uh, this thing about knowing and known, you know, that oftentimes we think of ourselves as knowing subjects, you know, so, we're, but we're not the only ones, but usually we think of ourselves as among those kinds of chunks of experience that stand in relationship of knowing the world. Okay, et cetera, et cetera. Or um, that we think of that we are, we think of ourselves as mortal, mortal beings, <clears throat> you know, mortal um, fleshy beings, right? So, so, so we can turn, do you see what I'm saying? I say, instead of, uh, instead of saying that uh, uh, because Xin Wei, okay, Instead of saying, I am aware I'm, of my mortality, uh, that's, I'm not saying it well. We can turn it around. Those parts of the world that think of themselves as mortal would be called living beings. Just flip it around, right? So you go around the universe uh, considering different chunks of experience. And this, sorry, this pen here, this pen, if, if it doesn't consider itself as mortal, then we'll say it's not a living being, right? To the degree that this pen thinks of itself, haha, even just say to think, considers mortality, then we say we consider it living. Now we come back to the house example, all these different experiences of the house, what was it? Uh, the history of the house, of which room is a, is a part. I'm not sure what he meant by this, okay? Maybe he meant, uh, uh, his or somebody's knowledge of the history of the house, maybe somebody else who lived there, right? Maybe the family that owned the house before him or the architects who built the house, you know, those are all possibilities, but Rachel's answer is more radical and fine, you know, 
Uh, it's funny because to me that was one of the clearest points in everything I read. I was okay. like, oh yeah, good. <laughs> the, the non non filtered by any human, just the house's history is plain and simple. We mm -hmm. may never know it, but mm -hmm. uh, the question is subject and subjectivity. You know. Okay. Cool. Uh, let's keep walking. So, what's another passage beyond this point that we should could pause and look at? It's not a passage, but his references to Kant really mm -hmm. caught my eye. Yeah. Okay. So maybe you can find one place where he talks about that. One first part is right at the beginning. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the transcendentalism. Yeah, okay. I'm, okay. I'm just doing a search through the text for Kant, where Kant he refers to Kant. Let's look at 37, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, 37 is uh, section 37. Uh, you want to read that passage if you're there? Um, yeah. Go ahead. The entire thing? Well, use your judgment. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I'll start slightly up. So it's the yeah, sentence. okay. Um, let the case be what it may in others. I am as confident as I am of anything that in myself, the stream of thinking, which I recognize empathetically as a phenomenon, is only a careless name for what, when scrutinized, reveals itself to consist chiefly that of the stream of my <laughs> the I think, which Kant said must be able to accompany all my objects, is the I breathe, which actually does accompany them. There are other internal facts besides breathing. Intras septolic, muscular <laughs> adjustments, etc., of which I have said a word in my larger psychology. And these increase the assets of consciousness so far as the latter is subject to immediate perception. But breath, which was ever the original of spirit, breath moving outwards between the glottis and the nostrils, is, I am persuaded, the essence out of which philosophers <laughs> have constructed the entity known to them as consciousness. That entity is fictitious, <laughs> while thoughts in the concrete are fully real. The thoughts in the concrete are made of the same stuff as things are. There you go. This is pretty uh, strong. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I, like, I've done Maybe a lot I of work with Kant, and, yeah. but, but this is a... Yeah, this is a very this is a very strong uh, saying. Oh, Kant is really nice, but we don't really need him. Yeah. <laughs> but well, well, well no. Can you maybe since since you're probably fresher, Kant is fresher for you than than for. Maybe you can give us a sense. I, I picked the wrong. I picked the passage where he's actually blowing it apart. But maybe to be fair, we should first say a little bit. Well, why he's bringing up Kant in the first place? From what you um, know, from what you know, what what is Kant doing? Well, just a lot of. Enlightenment thinking. I particularly studied Kant in philosophy of law classes mm -hmm. and like in a lot of the related ways. Uh, yeah, he's not too familiar with me because I haven't talked about him in a while, but. But okay, so the thing about I think, all right. Um, um, Let's see, what's a, what's a very short, um, okay. Also, I think uh, Cameron, you brought him up too. Okay, so to, to really understand something more, I would recommend that you take a course from Adam Nocek, my colleague who is a philosopher, trained philosopher, and he has very good, very um, acute um, um, ways to, to explain Kant that I can't do, okay. Um, but I think for this purpose, some of the key points here would be how um, there's some basic categories that Kant says that we use to interpret what we perceive, okay? And these categories are not dependent on experience, meaning we use them to filter experience, 
but we don't derive them from experience, <clears throat> you know, empirically. Okay. And the basic uh, key, key examples for Kant were space or geometry, actually, structures of space, spatial structures and time. These are the kind of key examples of the basic schema uh, through which we filter experiences. And, but the way he arrives at it is, is very, very elaborate and very carefully done. Okay, why these categories, okay? Because, because it's not like um, things you can establish by uh, argument, you know, like the syllogistic logic that we said before, you know, more basic than that. Nor are they derived from uh, the, the life the school of hard knocks, you know, learning that, you know, better not cross the road when traffic, when the light is green because I'm not getting run over by car, blah, blah, blah. Okay, nothing like that. Okay, so, but these are a particular kind of set of um, uh, patterns, let's say, that help us, that in fact, not help us, that are the only way we can make sense of what we're sensing. Okay, this is Kant. Okay, now, this is a cartoon Kant, okay? Now, um, it's interesting here, in section 37 is this, I think, this is our thinking. This is kind of a deep version, a deep, Part, part of thinking, the thinking response, the thinking being's response to, to perception. But what's funny here is that <laughs> James is saying, oh, it's just breathing. <laughs> it's just inhalation, exhalation, or rare going through the nostrils. It's just that, okay? That consciousness is not more than what is already being done by the body. So it's very, pretty radical. It's pretty like breaking it down to be absolutely concrete. But it's not just matter, it's body. There's a difference. This is living body, a living body, okay? So I wanted to share at this point, uh, maybe it, I'm glad to point this out, but I'm gonna share screen. Oops, don't turn the camera off. With a bit of Wittgenstein. When I was reading this passage, I, I thought of Wittgenstein and here, I can make a zoom, I oh, yeah, good. Uh, I copied out the passage that I thought was very funny from Wittgenstein that kind of relates to it. Okay, don't bother with the words, I'll just say it. So remember last week we talked about this uh, section where Wittgenstein is asking about, you know, you, you write down a sequence of numbers and then you ask the other person to quote, copy the sequence and the person does something screwy instead of writing down. Okay, so A is, is this B or A he's talking about? Anyway, A is writing down some numbers and then B is watching, let's say, and B, B suddenly, says, suddenly says, oh, I know how to do it. Ah, I get it. And then B picks up the a pen and starts continuing the series, okay? And Wittgenstein is asking, so what does it mean to understand, to get it, you know? Uh, and, then, and then he starts describing these different ways of, of uh, explaining that situation. And then he describes in a very kind of the way that James describes things. Oh, maybe it's just, uh, what did he mean by saying that's easy or having this sensation that's easy? Such a sensation is, for example, I'm reading uh, that of a light intake of breath as when one is slightly startled. That's understanding, right? He's being really hardcore. Say you don't need any, that's as good an account as uh, you know, Carl Frischem's, you know, least energy principle att attached to cognitive systems, blah, blah, blah. You know, in fact, it's more, it's just as likely as, some, as anything like that. Just as explanatory, okay. Um, and then that's Wittgenstein's point, <coughs> is that <coughs> later on is, he goes through all these other theories, like the theory of reading. You, your eyes pass along some squiggles on a piece of paper, and you're supposed to ask, well, how's this person understanding what he sees? You know, how is he reading? And then goes through various kinds of explanations and blows them up. Say, so this, this is okay, it doesn't work, doesn't work. And finally, he ends those sequence of paragraphs by saying, this is how those words are used, words like understanding. It would be quite misleading. Oh, come on. In this last case, for instance, to call the words a description of a mental state is this already is already unwarranted. One might rather call them a signal and we judge whether it was rightly employed by what he B goes on to do. In other words, see for Wittgenstein being also very um, uh, empirical, 
He says the only way we can understand if this person under, quote, understands the sequence of words is to see what this person does. Just observe the person. You know, it all goes back to observing what, what's happening. Hmm? Okay. Okay, enough banging on the horse. Let's keep going. Let's see. Or what is it? It's 548. It's also you can change. No. Okay, that'll be our transition. <laughs> change. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so uh, after this, somebody else can pick up, but I, I'm going to propose that we go to section 47. Uh, section 47. Uh, oh, it's backing up a little bit. Where? Uh, let's see. I have to go from my notes. Oh, my God. Page 21. Yeah, page 21. Oh my God. Okay, I forgot about this passage about. Uh, okay, he says that uh, section 46. Uh, section 45, sorry. Change tendency resistance and the causal order uh, generally, okay? It, it's basically, oh, wow. Uh, and he's talking about basically, okay. He's talking about basically how um, we organize this jumble of, uh, of chunks of experience, okay, uh, together and how, they, how we tie them together. And he says, well, there are these relations of activity tying the terms into series involving change, tendency, resistance, and causality, okay? Um, okay, and the relation experience between terms that form states of mind and are immediately conscious of continuing each other, okay? The organization of the self as a system of memories, purposes, strivings, fulfillments or disappointments is incidental to this most intimate of all relations, the terms of which seem in many cases to co-penetrate each other's being. So let's move on past the next paragraph. Okay, there, 46. Um, taking as it does appear, our universe is to a large extent chaotic. No one single type of connection that runs through all the experiences that compose it. Oh, that seems reasonable. Okay. Um, all right. Now, this is very important. See, there could be special relationships, you know, inside, outside, beside, underneath, but there are also causes and purposes, why things are happening, what causes something to happen, okay, materially, physically, energetically. Causes and purposes obtain only among special series of facts, okay? This is really important, okay? Because think about it, right? You know, we talk about uh, energetic phenomena, like things that require energy or mass or momentum. So you can use those kind of figures of thought to explain certain kinds of things, you know, like easy things would be like ball rolling downhill or car collisions, things like that. Um, but, you know, it, it doesn't apply for all sorts of things that we experience, right? Like geometry, for example, or, um, okay, so that's fine. But they're just different kinds of relationships, not one. Now, this is where it gets interesting. It's in 47, the bottom part of 47. Um, so down there are different kinds of, he said conjunction means putting together, okay, side by side. So there's different kinds of relationships. Now, the most troubling kind of, most problematic is this, also this comes back to the beginning example, this co-conscious transition, how one experience passes into another when both belong to the same self. That is me, okay, me, right? So, so, uh, so if we think in terms of building kind of grassroots, right, bottom up, building up from concrete experiences, I think Cameron asked us, so what's the unit of experience, right? There's no, there's no, there's no determinate answer to that, okay, right? Because the what constitutes a chunk of experience depends on how it's how it's a circular thing, right? It's how the emergent subjects that uh, uh, constituted, are, are constituting it, 
right? But the way that experiences are constituting, uh, are chunking up also uh, articulates the subjects in turn. And this is what's really like Alice in Wonderland about it, right? It's actually quite beautiful. See, we don't say there are no subjects in the world. Yeah, there are, yeah, there's me and you, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's just that we don't have to know in advance what those subjects are before things happen, okay? Because, you know, I mean, it's not that mysterious, right? I mean, think about it like any, I, I'll use this idea, an example from any relationship. Right. So who you are, if suppose you're in a, in a, in a, in a relationship with somebody new, okay, and who you are with that person is going to be different, obviously, than who you are with other people you're in a relationship with. And even at the same time, right, who you are with respect to various people depends on that relationship with that person. Uh, and may, they may be quite different, right? Um, so, and also it evolves, and it evolves, right? If you're with somebody long enough, you're going to both evolve. So the way you work together is not going to be the same in the future, just under the impact of the co-articulation of these entities. So this kind of ideal co I think this idea of co-articulation is quite, quite helpful, quite fruitful. Right? So that's why dating apps are not really that reliable, right? Just like you actually just list your predicates, you know, take a snapshot. <laughs> no, I mean, come on. I should, I should take, I just think it's very funny, right? And you just list these things, smoker, not smoker, and whatever, you know, as if that's enough, you know, and then they've done their job and move on. Okay. Um, I remember taking up smoking because of a girlfriend who actually was a smoker. And then I stopped after we, <laughs> we broke up. That's it. So, you know. My fiance stopped because I wouldn't date a There you go. See? Power of love. Yeah. <laughs> so now the really interesting thing in this passage is this idea of continuity. Uh, or maybe it's coming up, 48. He's see, and I want you to think, I mean, to see what, does this make sense or not, all right? He says, uh, well, before that point, my experiences and your experiences are with each other in different ways. See, my experiences pass into my experiences and yours into yours in a way that's different than how your experiences can pass into my experiences. So this is very abstract. But remember, I don't know if you, it's in this passage or somewhere else. Remember at some point he talks about a, my finger, you know, something like, um, like um, where is my finger? You know, like here, I'm putting my finger on my arm um, and then say, where is my finger? Well, I have this experience of my finger, my forefinger on my arm. And then, um, in order for you, I mean, obviously it's not your finger, not your arm, right? Or even I can put my finger on 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 Lo's arm, right? Here, hello. And that's how's oh, the owl? Okay, whatever. <laughs> how can we make the owl? Okay. Hello. Okay. <laughs> I won't do it. I won't touch. There we go. Okay. So I'm pretending that I'm closing the gap. So my finger is on Lo's cheek. Now, in order for um somebody else. He says, well, I can take the other person's finger and put it also there. So that defines there, it defines there, okay? But interesting, but throughout this, um, what's interesting here are several things. One is the passage of an experience into another experience that he says is largely continuous. He also says there are discontinuous transitions too. So I want to explore that with you, okay? Give me some examples in a minute. The other that's really crucial about this description is embodiment, is the way that somebody else can learn, <laughs> discern um, what I feel is using his body, his, his body. Okay, that these are embodied experiences. <clears throat> okay. So what about this claim that, um, what do you think? What are uh, some examples that, um, here, he says this, personal histories are processes of change in time, and the change itself is also one of the things immediately experienced. Change, in quotes, in this case, means continuous, as opposed to discontinuous transaction, a transition, okay? So what do you think? Is this, I came, is this a typical uh, experience? Uh, is that we experience 
experiences cont as continua? Yeah. And when is it not? Uh, when is it not continuous? When you sleep. <laughs> is that like, that's what I was thinking of it, yeah. Why? What? I would Sorry? Oh, I would disagree about the lack of continuity of sleep, but I'm curious what other people are saying. Yeah, how how how's it discontinued? I guess um like your awareness of things that are continuous changes and moves to your subconscious. So like let's say, you know, okay, so I'm in class right now, and then I'm gonna go home and I'm gonna go to sleep my awareness of me being in class earlier is no longer in the front of my mind and that's not what I'm thinking about. That's how I would explain that. But what about dreams? You know, dreams are continuous. Well, they but don't have to be. Like, I guess what I was thinking is it's not, it's not a, conti it's continuous within itself, but it's not continuous of your waking state. Yeah. Right. Okay. And then this idea of falling to sleep, mm -hmm. coming out of sleep, falling asleep. You know, these are seem to me, unless you get knocked out, right? These seem to be usually pretty, you know, continuous. In fact, sleep researchers give us that. Sleep researchers give us the actual measurements that show us continuously moving into different stages of sleep, right. but they're you know to, to continuous. But that's merely a you know, measurement thing. But is your experience just because the stages are continuous? Is your experience? That's a good question. Continuous? Good point. Yeah. Well, what what do you mean by experience? Because I think you're referring to like the conscious thought and maintaining a conscious idea in you know that you're aware of, but you're still experiencing things even if you aren't consciously feeling them, you're, you're breathing, you're all kinds of bodily processes are, are happening. And, and some part of your body is knowing, knows that, knows, I don't know, <laughs> is, is, has an awareness of that passage of time. I think basically thinking about the passage, he's talking about passage of, um, what is it? Does he doesn't call it the events, passage of what? Of one experience passing into another experience. It's largely continuous. And I'm trying to understand what that is, you know? Right. And it could be like, you know, I'm getting sleepier and sleepier, and then these are passages. Or, or you know what? Okay, so like, um, has this happened to you when you're falling asleep and you hear like the parties downstairs, you know, upstairs, you're just falling asleep. And then you can sort of, at first you can hear the words, you understand what people are saying there. But then you realize, I, oh my God, I, I must have missed a whole segment of conversation because we're not talking about this stuff anymore. So, but then it, I drift, I drift off, right? You kind of, I become pro progressively less um, um, able to parse what's going on out there, you know, stuff like that. So just like, it's interesting because there's this discontinuity of the fragments of speech, but I'm aware of myself falling to sleep. You know, it's really cool actually. Okay. Well, what, what, why then is, um... Is it discontinuous to be from one person's to another? That's the thing. Or rather, it's different. The passage is different. The passage of my experience of like over time, so to speak, of uh, is con normally continuous, like in a given state like that, like right now. Okay. Uh, now something's very funny going on, like, you know, I'm drugged or something, I like get knocked out. Okay. Right. But he's saying this basic thing that he's saying here is that this passage of my experience, experience after experience, experience that I call mine, is really different in quality than passing to your experience. I, you know, I think intuitively, right, this seems to make sense. I'm not, not sure that he's going to say that it's discontinuous. It's just that it's different. It's really qualitatively different. It's like two different streams, right, to jump from one stream to the other stream. It's really different than flowing down the stream. As the disconnect for sure. Okay, can we get to the passage where? Well, yeah, I mean, it's 49. What, um, what I do feel simply. Oh, yeah, I feel this continuous experience italicized. Yeah. Just as definite as the discontinuity experience, which I find it impossible to avoid when I seek to make a transition from an experience of mine 
uh, or my own to one of yours. Thank you. Is it, he does say discontinuous. So then it's the stream model, right? This kind of stream figure, like there are two different streams and then had to go step yeah. from one stream into another. <laughs> the break is positively experienced and noted. Though the functions exerted by my experience and by yours may be the same, yet the sameness has in this case to be ascertained expressly after the break has been felt. Whereas in passing from one of my own moments to another, the sameness of object and interest is unbroken. Yeah. Does everybody see that? This is section 49. So it is discontinuous, but it seems like it's a different kind of discontinuity. It, discontinuity hyphen experience. It's interesting. And that is a strong discontinuity. Absolutely. I mean, well, he has examples. Maybe we can pick some example and look at to to consider. Um, what could be a um, I was going to say a handshake, but maybe that's a bit too entangled. Oh, yeah. Well, we can say handshake, shaking hands with somebody. So this is a common experience, right? I'm shaking hands with you, and then we can switch. So I come up to you. I say hello shake your hand and you take my hand. All right, so that handshake is the shared event. And there's now, a, um, there's a, a key and peel like little skit, little short, where they're both, they're having a conversation about plans. They made plans together. And one of them, it, it, one's upset because the other is not, um, they're both wanting to see each other, but the way they're speaking, um, they are taking the opposite meaning from each other. So they're having the exact same conversation, but the one of them's having this, like one's getting furious and is taking everything. I think that happens a lot in texts, actually. These people were talking to each other, but um, yeah, you're both experiencing it, but it's not at all the same experience. Yep. And I think pain too. Well, yeah, yeah, definitely. What if, like, for example, let's say it was summer right now. It's like 120 degrees outside, and we all exit this building, and like the experience of us all, like, like the heat of outside, like how. Something like that. Uh, or maybe stepping from well one person to another person's experience that's the question okay that that's stepping across and how that would feel different so um but, but, well let's take heat the pain of the heat okay and then i i'm come back inside and i tell you about it right or maybe even you know that i'm going outside and you know you know you know from your own experience how bad it is to walk 10 minutes under 120 degrees okay so, uh, but I'm the one doing the walking. Okay. okay, I'm the one outside. I feel that heat. I feel the pain. Okay, ten minutes, and and then you are trying to um, put yourself into my mm -hmm. position, Im imaginatively, imagining what I'm experiencing, and that's a discontinuity. Right. That's a discontinuity. Uh, but I'm thinking of something where there's a physical connection, and still there's a discontinuity. You know, like my feeling the handshake from my point of view. And then um, if I try to flip into what you are perceiving, then it's going to be a discontinuity because it's not even my point of view anymore. Same handshake. Yeah. I think the, the big issue is that we can flip it around. This is again a point where maybe we can flip it around, by which I mean uh, those sequences, I think he even uses this kind of, yeah. Here, uh, it's in my notes, but probably somewhere in section 47. He says, of section 49, he says, my own experience has a continuity, but passing from mine to yours, there's a discontinuity. And the words are, the text is, I have to get on and off again to pass from a thing lived to another thing only conceived. Okay. Um, and that made me think, you know, um, Maybe we can flip it around in this case, in this way. That is, 
um, all the chunks of experience that stream together in what feels like a continuous stream, um, if they are associated with some form of subjectivity, could be said to belong to that subject's experience. Right, so just bundle up these chunks of experience and those that are stringed together in a sense in a stream, we call that one subject experience, okay? In other words, we can retroactively, so to speak, reverse engineer and, and, and construct subjects out of these streams that happen to chain together in some continuous way. Okay, this is just a speculative approach, yeah. What if, okay, so like people, like twins who were born, Conjoined. Uh, uh. Like, what would that would that be? Because you're like you're the same body but two different minds. And they still have different different still, experiences, right? Um, I thought you were going to say it's joined. Right? Well, they're, they have the same. Yeah, they have different experiences, right? Mm -hmm. As long as they have different different abilities to speak and to hear right. and to see things, you know. I saw you were talking about things that share one brain. Well, that too. But that's worse. <laughs> that's, yeah. Yeah. So there are gradations. There'll be gradations. Well, then what about the, uh, what about split brain, split brain? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, um, it could be, right? Because nothing in what I just said or these uh, talks about, you know, how do you say this? Um, how many different subjectivities share? I mean, remember, I mean, this is also in his uh, essay, can two minds share the same thing, right? And also earlier on, we talked about the intersection, somebody found that. So we can have a, a, an event like this candle here, right? Being shared by multiple, um, multiple remembrances, <clears throat> okay? So there's just intersection, so why not, right? Or not. So this all, you know, how, how does this get applied? I mean, think about it. I mean, when we're writing, uh, when we're creating any kind of technologies, like in the era of the personal computer, now what, since 1984, let's say? So what is this guy, like 40 years already? 40 years of PCs, okay? And we have all these technologies that are built for the user, right? And the user, there's a, all these different fancy. I hate this. I hate this. I can't believe it. Okay, is there, is there a way to turn that off? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so go to the your top, um, like the bar on the Mac where the, uh, like this preferences. Like oh, the, I'll deal with it later. If you don't mind, I'll deal with it. Okay, well, yeah. it's, it's super quick, but yeah, we can do it later. Okay. Uh, what um, what was he saying? Uh, user experience. Uh, the, user experience. Yeah. The user experience model, right? Typical for UI design or user experience design. Well, let's say UI design is modeled on the notion of the atomic subject, right? The atomic subject. And then it's kind of, um, and this one-to-one -one relationship between user and device. Mm -hmm. Okay. So of course it's different with something like, you know, communication systems, right? But even there, email, let's say, or Twitter or what have you, right? It's so interesting because it's still one atomic user at one end and atomic user at the other end. <clears throat> Right, so it's still you know atom to atom. So um, whereas uh, another way to think, another way to think would be maybe that channel between them is a shared. It's it's a it's a first class object. I mean entity in your design, and it should be treated on its terms fully. So okay, this is still abstract. For example, to break it down more more. When you pick up a digital phone and you call somebody else on over a digital line, digital line, have you noticed that when you speak, the other person's voice is cut out? Typically, that's how, no how noise suppression works in a digital communication line. So only one voice is carried at a time. When the other person speaks, then you get muted and you both hear the other person speaking. So there's a threshold at which noise suppression kicks in. Okay, so the guarantee is only one voice that's being heard at a time. Now, there are all sorts of reasons for that, okay, like the data capacity, bandwidth capacity of a digital channel, blah, blah, blah. But if you, when you make calls on a copper line, on an analog phone line, which nobody does anymore, um, 
uh, if both people are speaking, they both hear both voices, just because that's because the electrons are just flowing back and forth. Okay, so this is a fundamental difference in the design of our digital technologies. It goes way down into the fundamental um, um, interpretation of, of, of the algorithms. Okay, so it's really pretty core. <laughs> it's burned in. Okay, let's go on. It's one of my let's go on. let's go on. Let's go let's let's go on to this to the next essay and then let's just start fresh. Okay, section thirty seven, chapter three. Or sorry, sorry. Let's jump since we're running out of time. Let's jump to chapter four. How can two my how two minds can know one thing, um, and. Oh, do, do, do. Are we in the hundreds now? 127? Because uh, let's get to some. Thing in relations, we're passing over. Uh, it's worth looking at, but I, I want to just get to some stuff here. Page 49 in the PDF. And just one last comment about, uh, about continuity of experience, okay? Um, uh, another comment coming from, from programming and stuff. You know, if I walk towards you, normally if I walk towards you, walk towards you, what abs I, I, I don't feel like I'm popping in and, out, <laughs> in, a, in and out of existence normally. My consciousness is I continuously approach you, approach you, right? But uh, people like to talk about discrete systems, right? So the, this idea of discreteness is very much part of our cognitive fabric these days, right? So we think about, um, uh, like in game design, we think about usually a space of discrete action. So you're in a different state in the game, and then the player has a finite set of successor states. You know, I'm now in this room, I can go through one of the four doors and then I can pick up one of, you know, 17 objects or whatever, okay, whatever. So they're usually modeled as a discrete graph, just kind of the action, the decision tree, right? It's a discrete tree in the graph. Um, but that goes for everything, basically. The model is always, you know, usually think thought of this way as a graph structure as well, the spatial model, okay? but that doesn't accord with the continuity of lived experience, right? So, um, and you know, it's a it's a it's an engineering constraint that well, computers are not infinitely big, right? So we need to have some sort of chunking up of the uh, activity uh, space, you know, and the game state space, you know, to, to we have to make a finite model, right? So that's, it's normal, it's, it's reasonable to, to do this kind of discretization, but it doesn't accord with the felt experience of continuity. Okay. So I think that's one of the fundamental design challenges. That's why you know, my labs were treating, the biological media lab and synthesis center we're, we're dealing with, okay. How to put this continuity back in to the computer systems that we build. Okay, so there's that. Okay, so let's go. Um, See, just, just scanning through any passages we should look at. One twenty-seven. Um, One twenty-eight. Talking about unit of pure experience. Um, oh, I don't have one twenty-eight marked here. Maybe it's disappeared. There's two 126. Oh. Oh, yes, you're right. 126 is numbered wrong. So where does he talk about unit? Because I, I'm still thinking about uh, Cameron's question about chunk. Uh, what do you mean? Yeah, he talks about unit of experience in 126. Yeah, 126. The first, the first one. Uh huh. 128 is missing as well. Yeah. Are the numbers based on? I was just being curious. Are the numbers based on? Is it like handwritten pages? Of I'm. I'm guessing. I'm, I don't know. I'm guessing that they came from the original edition. 
but they're pretty small chunks. So I don't understand, you know, they're very small pages, but I think they're just chunks, just passages. Okay, this one. But 126, yeah, 126. Okay, first of all, is this is this reasonable? I, I, you know, I just want to ask anyway, because he's trying to use a geometric figure. Let's say, can two minds know one thing? And the one thing being, I guess, a chunk of experience. Um, and I like this example he talks about uh, somewhere. You have a candle, right? You have the physical candle. And then if two people are both regarding the physical candle in the same room, then one person reaches out and snuffs it, and the candle disappears for me too, right? But, but, but suppose there is an imaginary candle, right? I say both of us imagine this candle sitting on this desk. There is no candle on this desk right now, okay? But we all imagine it. And then somebody in her imagination reaches out fictively in her imagination with an imaginary finger and snuffs out the imaginary candle without telling me, right? So that's a distinction between mental objects and physical shared objects. But that's not an argument against it being shared. I mean, he's claiming, okay, it's not an argument against being shared, which is like kind of head twisty, right? So, well, wait a minute. I thought you just said that sharedness is like um, um, the same things happen for both of us, right? right? In other words, if it's a physical candle, then there's kind of coherence issue, right? But if it's a fictive candle, then one person can stuff it out fictively and it's still lit in my head, in my mind. Mm. But you see where he's going with that. So, well, he said, then it's okay. It doesn't have to be. That's just a distinction between what's called mental objects and causal objects. And mental objects are those objects where causality doesn't pertain. <laughs> he's saying that can or cannot still be shared. It can be shared. It it's be just shared. not physical. It's not a physical shared thing. Physically shared. He says energetic somewhere. Um, Okay, let me just go find it. Energetic, energetic. I was just looking at it before we came in. Uh, no. Energetic. Okay, um, sorry, it's back in 32. If you go back to 32, it's on page 15. I'll just read it to you, okay? Um, actually, yeah, this is nice. Uh, uh, the, I'll read it from the middle, okay? The general group of experiences that act, that do not only possess their natures intrinsically, but wear them adjectivally and energetically turning them against another comes inevitably to be contrasted with the group whose members having identically the same natures, candles, fail to manifest them in the energetic way, okay? And then, so it's distinguishing between like a real fire and a, like a mental image of a fire, right? So it's not, not confusing, those two. They're really different, okay? Um, but he is saying something stronger before this passage, which I should read, okay? Because, okay, what is he saying? He's saying that uh, there are these idealists who say, well, you know, um, there's a really different world out there. Either there are uh, things you can feel and touch and they have properties like hot and cold. And then there are these concepts and the concepts are completely divorced from those uh, qualities of heat and cold. And then he says here, um, I'm surprised about this kind of uh, uh, division. Why, he says, for example, do we not, do we call a fire hot and water wet, it yet refuse to say that our mental state, when it is of, so to speak, those objects is either wet or hot, okay? He says, later on, he says something about, like, a memory of a painful event can be painful. It's often painful. Actually, so so there's no reason to have a kind of a metaphysical sharp cut between these kinds of qualities that we say only pertain to physical uh, 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 living bodies and concepts. No reason why this should be the case. Sometimes, sometimes not. Okay. 
And this is another example of modalism, I would say. And the answer is yes. I think this is an example of refusing this kind of abstract bifurcation. It's what's called an unbifurcated ontology. Okay. All right. I find the hmm. example of pain to be really interesting because mm -hmm. I would I would argue you can re-experience emotional pain. We kind of touched on this last week, but when we we're talking about grief. But I I broke my knee, for instance. I can sit here and talk about it. I don't remember what it felt like. I can't feel that physical pain again. Thank goodness. <laughs> And I, I know there are I know there are instances where people can have you know like phantom yeah phantom feelings, and trauma but um it's much less common than to experience emotional pain again. What trauma? Maybe it's not the same pain, but it's trauma, right? Mm -hmm. That's like a scar, mm -hmm. emotional yeah. scar. Yeah, that, it makes more sense to think about it that way. If I know one thing, say what? How does Jane define no one thing? Let's say I'm like looking. imaginary candle is different from your imaginary candle. Do we still share the same knowledge of knowing one, knowing the same thing? He's looking for, I'm looking for where he starts to argue this, that it's possible. Okay. Maybe you can help me find where. Um, first, he's saying it's not reasonable to, to deny that possibility. Um, He's using an analogy, so you know. Okay, bottom one twenty six. We, can we? See, he's asking the question at least. Can we see any way in which a unit of pure experience might enter into, or figure into diverse, sorry, streams of consciousness, without turning itself into two different units? Okay. There is a way, he says. Aha, section two. There is a way. Let's 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 look. Let's look. Okay, I'm going to. Do, shh. You guys are on Tanya and Cameron. You're on it too, right? So I'm going to start looking on section one twenty seven onward, <clears throat> page fifty fifty one. Ah, it gets tricky. So uh, he, he's numbering one, two, three, four. So let's let's see. He's using the pen as an example. Okay, section, looks like section up to 130, is describing how a pen, like a fountain pen, I guess, can enter into, into my experience, into one consciousness. Aha, use the word consciousness, uh, but one mind. How can it enter, conceivably enter into two? And that's section three. Okay, so he says in section 31 that all we have to do is to, to, uh, is to understand how a second subsequent experience called contemporary with the first one, with the first one, in which a similar act of appropriation. So I don't know what he means here by act of appropriation. We have to go back backward a little bit, an act of appropriation. Anybody want to try to give an ordinary language description? Think out loud appropriate. He says appropriation is part of the content of a later experience, wholly additionally to mm -hmm. the original. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know how to put that into <laughs> <laughs> easier words. <laughs> um, okay, homework. <laughs> Um, or rather, you know, it's funny because I, I used to I used to work with this friend and colleague of mine, uh, Michael Montanaro, who's a really great choreographer in Montreal, and we did this really elaborate uh, 
experiments, you know, with dancers and all these media people, programmers in these big spaces, you know, going out for like four weeks, three, four weeks in a giant, um, wonderful uh, black box space in Montreal. And then things would get really complicated. And when things get really complicated and we were just all stuck, you would say, okay, lunch. <laughs> lunch. <laughs> so I say, okay, let's just stop. I think uh, this appropriation he's talking about in one, two, three, four, in kind of in detail is, sorry, one, two, three, four, he's talking, giving a description, a subjective description of an appropriation of the pen, right? Into his consciousness. He has these qualia, the kind of, well, I shouldn't use the word qualia, but these kind of felt, felt aspects of the experience, okay? The warmth of the pen. Right, okay. He's putting everything in quotes, interest, attention, eyes employed, okay? Because he's bundling that up into what is gonna be called me. Okay, all right. So I suggest that we, uh, me too, we'll go back and think about this after class some other time, because this is what he integrates into account of absorption, okay? Okay, now that's however into me, into my experience. <laughs> And just as a general comment, in phenomenology, this kind of work would be like, you could think of phenomenological, meaning the study of experience. It's not the same thing as cognitive. In this kind of phenomenological reasoning, people often say, my experience. So in, grammatically, uh, syntactically, just be careful. That way we can signal that I'm, I'm really thinking about experience that I, each subject, each speaker can, can, can speak to, okay? Uh, I'm reading this passage 130. I think he's just repeating it. It's not a big deal because basically they don't interfere. There's, there's no interference. It's so that, so okay, like he's saying right here, right? The two acts of appropriation don't interfere with each other, okay? That's why he uses the figure of the point shared by inter as the intersection of two lines. There's no reason why not. And do you remember there's another passage he talks about how an acre of land which passed ownership from one person to another, is just one, a single piece of land. It can have two different owners, okay? And the thing I don't like about that, ex that example though is it's in time, right? It's passes from moment. But you can also just rethink and say, well, you can have two owners at the same time, why not? It just pointed that it's just one piece of land. I think he used the example of like heirs. You can have multiple heirs. Yes, you can have multiple heirs. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. Um, but okay, let me just open it up. So are there some other passages in the section that you'd like to, to point to? I'm going through by... I only have one more point after this that I want to uh, comment on. Yeah, okay. I, I don't think it's too 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 uh, too controversial, at least not for me. At least, um, the one thing I would like to point to is this word uh, chaos in one thirty three, uh, and also er, elsewhere he actually uses this kind of idea. So James, uh, there's some there's a very uh, famous phrase that that when James is credited with was we should talk about kind of experience just as a as a given, all right, without first posing subjects then it's a mess, right? I mean, come on, this, this universe is full of what he calls this, uh, what's called blooming, bubbling, blooming confusion, okay? It's just a, a mass of stuff happening, okay? So, but the, the amazing thing is that it gets ordered through these um, subjects that 
order the order the experiences. Okay, in different ways. Okay, in different ways. Um, but I guess that's the, that's the 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 the, the takeaway for today. Is, you know, is um, um, we don't need to pose subjects ahead of time as psychological subjects or whatever you know, uh, Marxist subjects or whatever ahead of time in order to um, have an account for um, uh, uh, a continuity of experience, okay? Like memory, let's say, okay? We can go the other way. We can start from um, empirically, right? From just chunks of experience and then um, see what chains together, you know? Like we have this, like you know, chain together. We can we know this in causality, right? We have kind of Rube Goldberg thing. So if I tip over this rock, it tumbles downhill, hits something else, and it causes this chain of effects that are energetic causal relationships. But it can also be other kinds of things like affective chains of effects, right? Or it could be you know political chains of effects, right? So the different chains of experiences, some of them we can associate with the coordinate. Of what will be called the coordinate subject. <laughs> okay. Okay. So that's a way to go. And then we go to now artificial intelligence and AI stuff. People like to talk about, you know, uh, artificial general intelligence and things like that. And they think it's, it's, um, and here I'm going to close James. Okay. I'm going to go to some other comment about AI. Is, uh, well, not close James, but just uh, close the text here. Okay, so keep going that. So what about now? You know, what about now when we have um, all these different kinds? Of, not so much LLMs because those are merely statistical. We're more thinking about like reasoning systems, right? Um, which are very primitive, but they are. Uh, but uh, so they they augment the way that we think about things, like chess, right? Or well, even that's kind of statistical. But there are strategic chess games and go games, right? Go. So the thing is this, it's, it's, it's really um, maybe more interesting to think about um, ensembles, right? This kind of combinations. That's why the new computer science department at ASU is called, what is that called? Computer science and augmented intelligence, not AI, not artificial intelligence, augmented intelligence. <clears throat> okay, that's more reasonable. Mm -hmm. So then we can ask about um, uh, the resultant subjects that emerge when we think about not humans on one side and machines on the other, but think about ensembles of joint systems, you know, fleshy bodies augmented by computational devices, you know, why not, right? And then we can ask about, well, what kinds of, or you can maybe before we do that and say, here's some chunks of experience happening, like a bunch of phenomena in uh, different kinds of uh, 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 social media spheres, let's say. And then we can say what chains together as the subject that corresponds to those chained experiences. You know, for example, in, in people know about is that Hakuna? That's an artificial performer, Miku. Is it Miku? M I K U. Hikuna Miku. The, one of the biggest performers in the planet. It has hundreds of millions of followers. I don't know. I'm getting this from some other people. But apparently, she's a fictitious character. She's this. Um, she's like. That's that's her with the hair. Thank you. Yeah. This is quick. Okay. Uh, I just searched Miku. Uh, yeah, Miku. Search for Miku. <laughs> M I K U. <laughs> so uh, kind of anime character. Okay, but apparently there are what tens, hundreds of thousands of people who are composing songs for her to sing yeah. because the company that put her out put out the software, the code that allows anyone to basically go on there, log in, and create a song that is voiced and sung by the synthesis um, you know, in, in audio, right? Produces a singing voice. So it's pretty amazing. <coughs> Apparently there's a big fan club around the world that creates songs for this fictitious character to sing. And she performs on stage. Basically they go to live concerts with you know, people buying tickets, crowding the stage and she's projected holographically onto some screen. And she's there with her anime hair and she's singing the songs that the fans have created for her. So this is probably one of the biggest phenomena right now on the planet. That is wild. Yeah. It's <laughs> a lot of music videos. That's so interesting. 
Anyway. It, okay. So that's actually from like almost 10 years ago. Now that yes, technology has advanced. Oh, really? Yeah, um, this is 2007. So it's still going. It's still going now. Right. Yeah, now, now it sounds that's pretty natural. Yeah. yeah. Allegedly. No, it's gotten pretty sophisticated. <laughs> so this is one of the biggest performers on the planet. Okay, that's uh, in the uh, in English. It's actually, the company made like a family of characters. She just really? one of them. Yes. <gasps> There's wow. different gender, different age group, different sound. I've never heard of that. So you know, you're in the know. Because it's quite famous in China. It's <laughs> <laughs> Okay, guys, um, that's it for today. Any, any, any last questions or comments for James? Okay. I, did, I do actually have Please. some questions. Please. I've been trying to figure out, so Cameron and I started a little bit of a conversation on the Padlet. And one of the things that you mentioned at the beginning, he sometimes holds, explain an argument and then kind of tear it apart. Sometimes it made it confusing for me, which he's arguing yeah. for. Um, was he saying that thought and things, uh, is that dualism or is, he's arguing it's not dualism? Thought versus things or thought? Thoughts and things. I'm trying to find, I had it pulled up before and then I lost it. Yeah, I think I remember that him referring to this, but I thought that. There's, there's a self-contradiction here from which the radical dualism of thought and thing is the only truth that can save us. What is that? What is that? Um, it's 28 on page 14. But it's early on. Okay. Okay. But it's in a section where he's talking about objections. But... 20, uh, uh, section 28? Ah, section 28. Sorry, I'm, I'm on the wrong page. Section 28. Ah, here we go. Yeah, I remember coming across this section here. It's right in the middle of this paragraph. Yeah. All oh, right. This goes along with the question from Cameron, I guess, and you guys on, on whether he's dualist or not. He's not dualist, right? Yeah. So he's arguing against, against this, okay. against this, yeah. Because here it says later on, it gets less satisfactory the more one turns it in one's mind. To begin with, our thought and thing as heterogeneous as claimed. And he's arguing that they are not that heterogeneous. Yeah. And this is where he's talking about, oh, this is very funny. Uh, where he talks about adjectives, right? This thing about, you know, uh, happy th thoughts about happy things being happy thoughts, for example, right? Or the, or rather, not necessarily one to one like that, but more this idea that those adjectives can be pertaining to thoughts too. So why not, right? And just that adjectival um, uh, polymorphism uh, suggests that this division between things and thoughts is not so metaphysically hard. Okay, and later on he talks about how. These, the fact that adjectives can get reattached means that adjectives go on a holiday. They, they, they just go wandering around, right? This kind of promiscuous, promiscuousness of adjectives suggests that this, this distinction between thoughts and things is not that, not that uh, hard and fast. Okay, it's funny, yeah. Okay, cool. Next week, all right, next week doing the Zoom, uh, we're gonna be uh, reading Melo Ponty. And to give you some, a little bit of, um, do we have time? Yes, a little bit of um, uh, intro uh, for this. So uh, I mentioned phenomenology, okay? So we, when people say phenomenology, it's about experience. It's really about, you know, the science of thinking about experience. And that's different than the way maybe people talk, definitely different from the way that people think about um, like neuroscience or uh, cognitive science or psychology in the following way. Basically, you know, if you do about neuroscience, then basically it's about the brain, right? It's about taking measurements of data coming from the brain. So it's brain, 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 brain. And then they say, well, you know, we have actually, we do, you know, we have bodies and hands and we have our gut and people also, why do you get, you know, stomach aches sometimes or your heart pounds, right? I mean, after all, we do actually have this kind of bodily engagement with um, things that we think about or feel, right? It's not just the brain. 
Okay, so so this kind of um, uh, so just trying to understand, you know, how the limbic system, how um, how uh, memories function with uh, with uh, conditioned experiences as important as as looking at what the brain does. Okay. So, so experience is more than what we can learn from doing brain studies. That's one thing. So, um, and another is um, physics, right? Um, kind of causal uh, issues. Well, and uh, we can explain certain uh, bits of experience, obviously, because we do live in the physical world, okay? Um, but uh, I'd like to use this example of um, smoke. Now, so if we were in the same space, we could try this, right? And if we're not in, in Phoenix, we could try this for real. I usually ask for somebody to buy the cigarette, okay? And you go to this, anybody, there are those other smokers here? No, okay, so it can't work. So anyway, so I asked someone to, this works in Spain, okay? I asked someone to buy the cigarette, and they buy the cigarette, and then I wait for people, I'd say to people, raise your hands, raise your hand when you can smell the smoke. Okay, and then what usually happens is that the person closest to the smoker has the hand and then farther and farther away, they start raising their hands, okay? Later and later and later, okay? Um, and then I ask, where's the smoke? Okay, this question, where's the smoke? So think about it. So what plays a role in answering that question? Well, First of all, physics, that's clear. Okay. The diffusion of smoke, of smoke particles. But what else? What else well, plays? Everyone has a different answer. So where the person answering the question also is. Yep, with the geometry. And then what else plays a role? What else plays a role? I would, if you were asking me, I would like try to look for a visual cue, like sight. Yeah, well, I can ask them to do the same thing with perfume. So it's invisible. Mm -hmm. But well, let's keep going. This site, okay, that's geometry. But what else? What else could play a role in how what's happening when people are raising their hands one after the other? The AC current. Suppose it's invisible. Suppose it's perfume. <clears throat> well, oh, go ahead. A pattern of movement. That's physics. That's all physics. Okay, that's physics. That's fine. We got that. I, I would. Yeah. We're going with this as like some social contagion thing. Of, In what sense? Or, or like that there was potentially like the person didn't. Uh, I was thinking of other experiences where people like will default to what the the people around them are believing as opposed to what they are actually experiencing. Ah, that, yeah, that get that gets into the yeah interesting terrain. Yeah. Um, well, first of all. Um, even if two people are sitting at the same distance, or even next to each other, okay, uh, maybe one person raises her hand first before the other. Well, under under what conditions could that happen? Without the social contagion thing, why would one person raise her hand first? They have better sense. Yeah, nothing nothing mysterious. But person just has a more sensitive nose, mm -hmm. right? So that's a matter of physiology not physics, mm -hmm. physiology, mm -hmm. okay? So that becomes a metabolic issue. That's a biological issue, not physics anymore. It's beyond physics, all right? Another thing would be, um, it gets into the social, is, um, well, okay, there's also a memory, right? Suppose the person has never smelled smoke before. So I, the person doesn't know what smoke smells like because mm -hmm. the person has never smelled smoke before. Could be right a cigarette smoke they may not know okay what to be smelling so that's that begins to get into memory and another is um, suppose i didn't ask this question okay and then would you think maybe some people may notice not notice the smoke until i ask the question you see right so this is beyond physiology. This is even beyond physiology. That means it's a matter of an expectation. If you don't expect to smell the smoke, you don't smell the smoke until you're told that it's smoke and then you smell the smoke. So, so see, that shows you very clearly that experience is more than physics, is more than physiology, and even it can involve expectation, which is no longer physiology. 
So phenomenology is the study of experience where we try to account for how we experience things beyond the physics and beyond the um, physiology and beyond even psychology, <clears throat> like the thing about social, you know, um, social expectation. Okay. And this point. So, so Merleau-Ponty really thinks about fundamentally like notions of spatiality, how I relate to, how we each of us relate to the world through our spatial relationships or through time or through the fact that we have a body, okay? That we're engaging with the world through bodies, okay? okay. But accounting for all that beyond physics and beyond physiology, and beyond psychology, there's more, okay? Hopefully that's enough to... So, and we're presenting next week. Yeah, about Merle Ponty. Okay. Okay, guys. Yeah. See you. Yeah. 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 Uh, if, if not, I'll send an email out too. Okay. See you in the Zoom next Thank week. Thank you. All right. Bye. 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 Good talk. Take care.